Is that right? Okay. Okay. Uh, so this is going to be a little bit of a weird talk, I guess. In the past, I talked about benchmarking and optimization or data fitting, very technical. This one is more like philosophical, maybe a little bit. But let's see if we can get the discussion going. Uh, There's no AV guy that looks in there. Okay, there, there are two sort of heavy words in the title. Efficiency, basically do more with less code and in less time, and hopefully the coding runs faster. And beauty, of course, there are many opinions of, about that, but I'm gonna talk mostly about the diagram and not the front panel. There are other talks that talk about the front panel. So don't judge a VI by its front panel alone. There's probably a lot of lipstick on the front panel, and maybe there is a really the caves and crypts underneath there. So, so who's that guy? Okay, I'm almost like Putnam, so we're a living fossil. I learned programming <laughs> in the early 70s, uh, punch cards. Started LabU4, with LabU4, and use it every day. Though I'm not a programmer at all, I'm, I'm a biophysicist, and I just, it's just a tool. I need to make the computer jump through hoops and do what I want it to do, and off-the-shelf software doesn't do that. And also, I love recreational programming, just do little, little puzzles or uh, uh, coding computations and long walks on the beach. I'm in Venice. So my, in my early days, I probably showed that a couple of years ago, I learned programming in high school. We had a punch card puncher, and then we took the stack of cards, got on a bus, and went to the city of our community, to the, to the federal building, and they had a computer, CDC 3200, was already a little bit old back then, put our cards in, and picked up the printout later. Yeah, we programmed with paper and number two pencil on the, and then we transferred it to punch card. And then later, many years later, in uh, about 96, our old Nikolai 1280 computer was a full rack. This is only, this is the processing and it had much more things in it. It had like a big card in it that said big RAM with all discrete chips. I think it was like 128K or something. And, and that sort of started failing, and we looked for a PC-based solution, and I went to one of those NI uh, product shows, and I think John Coons, I think he's still with NI, he said, yeah, I can do that with LabVIEW, so we bought an ISOBOS card, a Windows 95 computer. I wrote my first program, I never had heard LabVIEW before, I learned about race conditions, the hardware, <laughs> art way, and all that. And for some reason, that 95 computer was running for 20 years, 24-7, everybody used it, and never crashed, you know, but like last year, I finally moved it to SB Rio because the computer, this is 95 with like 32 megabytes of RAM, was just not that great anymore. You could, uh, they wouldn't let anything new older than Windows 7 on the network, so we couldn't print. So we had to do something. <laughs> so I'm not a computer scientist at all. You know, I, I learned the hardware just with programming every day and solving problems. And usually it works, especially if I use LabVIEW. And so there are many different opinions of what I'm going to tell you, and you can discuss that. So 
you might know better, so please interrupt me. Uh, so my talk is based on what I see on a, every day, like for example in the Lab U forum, it's a nice place to look at the code and see what kind of mistakes people typically make. I mean, the, there is an entire thread, it's the Ruth Goldberg thread, and here's an example, right? That, that they, an or of three booleans, right? You do sort of a, a, a stack of, of functions. Probably. Yeah. 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 So the equal truth, you know, I, I call it colloquial program. The guy tells it, okay, so here I have a boolean. If it's equal true, I have to do that. So he puts the equal true on there. <laughs> okay. So what's this talk all about? <coughs> The problem is I, I, I don't see it here, so I should, uh, yeah. Okay. Okay, there are many ways to write library programs. You know, everybody has their own styles. Companies sometimes define their styles. And so we just try to explore how we should approach graphical programming. It's really philosophical. And typically, a lot of talks talk about big frameworks and how it all fits together. And I sort of try to go, it's like a fractal, right? Dig in a little more into the details, because if the details are not good, you know, if it's, and you assemble all these details in a big framework, everything sort of comes up and makes it hard to maintain. It's like fractal scaling, right? I mean, if you travel, right, you can do 20 cities in 10 days, or you can stay in one little village for 10 days, and you probably get the same experience out of it. You discover something new on a local scale, uh, and so it's not one is better than the other. It's just on what scale do you want to look at things. And I will show very, very tiny simple code examples to demonstrate certain points. And so I keep it simple, so sit back and relax. So what is programming? It's also a slide I showed long ago. Long. It's the purpose of programming is to create a set of instructions that computers use to perform specific operations or to exhibit desired behaviors. So in more creative form is teaching the computer a new trick, right? Do something that nobody before here ever imagined. Not even the computer maker, not even the maker of the development software, right? We let it jump through flaming hoops, and that's what we do. So what is information? If we look at the diagram, right, how long does it take us to understand what's there? So identical information can be presented in many, many different ways, and some ways make it more easier to intuitive to grasp and others. That's how the brain works, right? And there are many pitfalls, as we have learned in the election and politics and all these things. Uh, so for example, we have two ways of representing the chessboard, right? We can the FEN notation, that's the red text, and we have, or we have the starting position. The information is absolutely identical between those two, right? And so the question is, one is simpler to read. Now the problem is, people think like graphical programming is easier. It's not, right? If you don't know the rules of the game, how the pieces move, both are equally worthless. So graphical alone is not enough. So our Visual system has really evolved to view that information. Here's a, a, a map of Los Angeles. We recognize it immediately, right? That it's pixel by pixel, it's the right slide, but it's not presented in a form that we can process easily. So let's flip it around, and now it's much better, right? 
So even though we got the identical information, one way is much easier to process than the other one. Right? So our visual system is really, really good at recognizing shapes and looking at relative elements. If they're a little kid, can tell a cat from a dog, which is relatively hard to computers. It's getting easier, but still. So we just need to make sure that we stay in a conventional format, even in the diagram. So if somebody paints the background line green and the for loops bright red, everybody gets confused. And we've seen that on the floor. So same for LabVIEW, right? Functionally, we have an infinite number of ways to uh, arrange a functional identical code. Some are better than others, and it makes it much easier, I just said that. And one thing is, of course, the brain can be trained to look at diagrams. If you only look at your own diagrams, you somehow get tunnel vision. But if you always go to the forum and look at many different programs from other people, not only do you train your visual processing system to look at different code, but you also maybe help your overall understanding. Has anyone seen the movie The Founder? It's actually interesting. It's about the, the guy that, that uh, invented the McDonald's franchise. And the original brother of McDonald's, the key invention was the speeding system. And they, they, I'm not sure if they still use that word. But basically, they tried to arrange in the kitchen everything for perfect flow, right? And the same idea goes with the diagram. So here's a picture you're in for the movie. The guy stands on the ladder, and they, with chalk on the tennis court, they, they put all the areas, you know, the fries, the griddle. And all the people made their jobs, and they see how they, arrange, they rearranged it and see which one has the best flow. And of course, when we program in lab, we do the same thing. Finger rebooting, that's basically what the pianist does if he doesn't perform, right? You, you do certain runs, you know, you practice certain little things. And uh, we can do the same thing in, in LabVIEW, of course, where we just try to solve a very small problem. So here are two code fragments. and. I can guarantee you that they function exactly the same. Uh, if this one had a knot in it, then we would know it's LabVIEW 4 uh, between the stop and the uh, termination condition. But, uh, and both buttons are latch action, so right side only works if the default value of the stop button is true. A latch action button actually switches from the default to the non-default until it's red. It doesn't switch to defaults necessarily. So, so if, if we do that, right, then this one will also stop once we press it. Of course, the problem now is that we shouldn't be too creative. This is much easier to understand if we press the stop button and it stops. So a text program always starts in the upper left corner. They have it easy, right? A library program can start anywhere, place things all over the diagram, and all that counts at the end is the data dependency. You can actually do select all and align vertically and horizontally and put it all in one big pile, and it still works exactly the same. So one, one nice thing in LabVIEW is we have the structures, the delineation, and they always have an inside and an outside. And a lot of people seem to confuse what side of the border things should go. You often see code that's identical in two different 
cases of, for example, the case structure. And so duplicate code is, is a lot of problem. If you have a lot of same multiplication, uh, the same operations in two different case structures, and you notice that there's an error, right? You have to make the same correction in two different places, and maybe you forget one. If it's a rare case, it won't show up until your introduction. There's a side issue that very advanced programs sometimes actually duplicate the code to avoid like branch, uh, uh, branching in the in the code, and there might be some performance advantage. But we still cannot predict what the lab you compiler will do out of all of it. So we're not 100 percent sure. A simple example: you have, you have a case structure with two different cases I show them on, on top of each other. They do the same thing, and the only difference is the tree. And we see a lot of pe people just put one terminal in one case and then a local variable or a value property you node know, in the other one to switch it over. And it's much easier if we see everything at once. And we have a lot of choices. So here's a to place all our code elements. So here's a very simple event loop that increments the value whenever we press that increment button and stops and we stop. And it works perfectly fine. We run it, run it, run it, and then we stop it. And we run it again, and that value is still at a very high number. So that pisses us off. So what do we do about it? Right. <laughs> it has no bearing once we build an executable, but so we want to fix that, right? So what we see is something like that, right? Uh, and then some smart <coughs> guy looks over your shoulder and says, "Hey, wait! There's a race condition. That local value va uh, variable." runs in parallel to the loop. So there is an infinitely small chance that actually this one updates first and then it goes to resets to zero. So maybe we should use a value property node and wire the error so it executes first. Right? <coughs> or we use a rocket launch if you will mosquito. <laughs> <laughs> and we reset the other thing <laughs> And then somebody knows about VI properties. You can do clear indicators when called. So whenever you run it again, all the indicators clear or go to their defaults. So that solves the problem. But again, this is sort of a hidden thing, and we don't really know if it's set or not. So why don't we just put the indicator right there? Now, everything is, is fine, right? As soon as the program runs, the zero gets written, it waits until it increments, and then it shows the new value. So, uh, so instead of adding code, a better arrangement is sometimes simpler. So this is one of those examples. Same about the stop button. That's the silliest thing in the world. Most library programs usually have a stop button. So where should it go, right? You have a you have a while loop on the diagram, you right click on the terminal that says create control, and it ends up in the upper left corner. If you look at some of the example programs, it's typically in the lower right. But if you give that program to a non-programmer, he probably will stop it up there, right? Nowhere else. I mean, there is no program except LabVIEW in the world that has a stop button. Have you ever stopped Excel or Word or you know? <laughs> <laughs> no, it runs, right? So, so the X is a little dangerous, right? Because it just kills it. So if there is, if we have like a program that runs a motor or uh, has a high voltage or a safety analog, it just drops that and these things might stay on. So it might be very dangerous. So we just need to capture it and there's a nice panel closed filtering event that we can discard. It discard, so Windows doesn't even see it. 
and and uh, try to read it. Okay. And then do whatever we needs to be done before the program closes itself. Right. So this card is important, so Windows does not see it. So there's one problem. I often have multiple loops on the diagram. Some people don't like it, but if you have a, each loop has a, each event structure has its own loop, you're fine. The problem is if you have, if you now try to stop two different loops with their event structure with this, whatever, you cannot predict which one sees it first, <coughs> but whatever event structure sees it first will discard it so the other one doesn't see it. So you have to somehow kill the other loops later. So, so just kill the, uh, the main loop that does the hardware interaction and all the cosmetics loop that deal with the user interface. You can't just kill, you can just pull the plug once, this, once everything is done, right? So, Christian, yeah. did you just say that you have programs that have two event structures in parallel I have three, most, most of the time. I have one that I have, I have one that does like certain things. I have always one in the upper corner, good question though, which does nothing else but cosmetics. Cosmetics. Yeah. Uh, and I mean all the all the data is handled with one and all the heavy lifting. But one, for example, if you click on one button, for example, or or on a checkbox you want certain things to appear and other things not to appear. So this is just hand in a loop. So even if the other one is slow, once I click there, this one just does it, and it, it's done over. But uh, it's a controversial issue. You always see these dogmas, yeah, one loop per, one event per VI and all that. But it's bad if you have two event structures in the same loop, right? <laughs> Unless you make them transparent and have zero time on them. Right. Right. And then you wouldn't have that problem. Uh, right. No, I mean that's right. That's right. Only one. One place. It's it's, it's it's for for maintenance. If I keep all the cosmetics in one little thing, I have the main the main event structure has probably like thirty cases. And if I try to put everything in there too, it, it's it's hard to find things. It's just much easier to edit for me. But but yes, I mean I just pull the plug. And if it's if it's a, an application, I kill it. If it's not an application, I stop it. So I'm back in editing. But yeah, I mean yeah, it's a good point. You know there. But uh, it's just for me, it's it's easier to deal with things. If, data we have to think digitally in an analog world and uh, a lot of people seem to have problems with that. So yeah, everything in the world is quantized, we have atoms, we have energy levels and all that and we don't really notice it, I mean the world looks analog to us, right? But in computers everything is quantized at a much higher scale, we have only a limited number of bits for everything and even time it, on computers is highly quantized, right? There is a clock cycle, you cannot go faster than that, you cannot go analog there. And some people even say that in real life is a time quantum. Uh, so should we fight it or embrace it? And I will show you two examples. So embracing the limitation allows us to write very efficient code that still knows the design system accurately. 
So for example, if we acquire a 12 bits, we don't want to need to convert to extended precision, and sometimes we see that. So the typical example, of course, is the binary representation of like 0.1. This will never stop. So we need to pick, always pick the right data types. And usually, don't be too creative. Uh, usually, I32 is good for anything that goes to an index. Double is good for almost all calculations. U32 is good for things that roll over at the end, like time. And otherwise, enums are nice too because they automatically log roll over if you do a plus one on the enum and it's on the last item, it goes back to the first one. It's very nice, like in a state machine. So you can always go to the next state by just doing plus one. Don't do a plus and then a number one, that will break it. <laughs> so, for example, in, in, in my science, we often have to like, we cannot solve things analytically, so we have to, for example, generate a, a lot of angles in space and calculate certain states and then average them. So one of the problems is that this makes uh, partial errors really hard to deal with because a, a histogram always goes to the nearest pin and it's sort of binary, so if we shift by a uh, a micron, you might have a large step or nothing at all. So to fix it, some people might use an insane amount of directions and means and says average a million directions, right? And use very, very fine bits, but it doesn't solve anything because it's still rough, rough on a microscopic scale. Fix two would be a fractional histogram, and that's what I always use that we always fill two adjacent bins proportional to the fraction value, for example. If you write on that middle, in the middle of it, we fill this one. If you write in between two, we fill each one half. And if you sort of a half, uh, like a third over, then you fill them proportionally. And I made an example. I can show that at the end. I'm not sure if I, how I can, uh, maybe I can. If you do that as a function of shift, right, you see it really jumps as a function of, of position. And if we do the, the, the fractional histogram, and now, now it, it's now that the center of gravity is exactly correctly for, 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 uh, for the fraction. So if we do an entire ramp of values, right, we get sort of, we just get a square, but you see how, how the, this one just jumps all, all, all around because you have these, these bins, you know, and so if you do the partial derivative of, of this function as a function of shift, you get huge steps or random, random. Uh, I should have duplicated this. Yeah. Okay. So this is one one simple example. So I have the example. What? Okay. This is another problem. <coughs> We have to solve in the lab, for example, if you have two 3D Gaussian distributions of an infinite number of points in space, and you want to calculate the distance prob probability, the average distance probability between all points between the pairs, right? Then we have a formula for that. 
one of the problems is that we have that exponential and the hyperbolic sign, and if you just blindly translate that into the red thing code, this thing will blow up like crazy if you, uh, uh, after a certain number. Uh, one goes to like 10 to the minus 300, one the other one goes to infinity or NAN, and you multiply, you get garbage for a large range of values. So what you can do instead, instead of the hyperbolic sign, you can make a little function that does the law, the natural log of the hyperbolic sign, and that actually turns into a constant after a certain value, and add them, and then take the exponent later, and it's all smooth. And then uh, an example there. Who is it? So, so, so you see, if if you get close, close to, uh, if they get close together, they sort of start distorting as a function of Gaussian width. And if you go further away, it did turn more and more into a Gaussian. And this is the fixed version that works perfectly fine. But if you look at the bad one, it's, it's identical, right? Until you go to a certain point and it starts blowing up and you get the NANs and the INFs and all that. And after a certain point, you don't have anything anymore. So again, think about the digital nature, you know, that everything is analog. Okay, let's stop that. Here. Okay, so the tools of the trade. <laughs> How much do we need, really need in the palettes? You know, uh, National Instrument gives us a rich collection of math functions, all the functions, and probably only 5% are used. So some people are sort of gadget hungry. You know, they, they want every uh, a new function for everything, and they have the palettes are bloated. And, all that. So what do we, how much do we really need? Do we really need that banana slicer? <laughs> right. <laughs> and the strawberry slicer, they have a drawer full of stuff. Right. You find those at Amazon. Uh, usually, usually a few tools are probably sufficient, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, of course, there are great toolkits and extensions. It's like if you have the kitchen, or right? going back to the analogy, you add a pizza oven, or an outdoor barbecue, or a sous vide system. These really extend the capability, something you can't do with a knife, right? But, but sometimes it's, it's not, you don't want to overdo it with all these detailed little things. By the time I figure out if a certain toolkit does exactly what I want and doesn't have mistakes, I have written my own already. <laughs> so there, there are, of course, very, very good toolkits out there, and they're highly recommended. <coughs> uh, this is just a single slide about, there's always the discussion of shift, shift register versus feedback node. It's the new versus old code. All the old people say, I don't understand the uh, feedback nodes. I, I learned shift register, it's all clear. And they both do the same thing with a few exceptions. The feedback node, for example, have a, has a global initialization option, which the shift register doesn't have. It's either initialized or not initialized, but the global it doesn't work. Right, so we have to do something with the first call primitive and some case structure. And so often, I tend to use the feedback node nowadays. It's just different to look at, but once you learn, again, like the chessboard, once you learn how to look at it, it's very easy. Question. Yes? Is one faster than the other as far as execution? 
There is a long discussion on the forum. I think at one point it was, the, feed, the shift register was slightly faster, but I think they were head to head now. In older versions, I think the feedback node was slightly slower. Yeah, 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 but uh, I mean, it's not something I would worry about, right? I mean, it's, 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 even if it's a factor of two, it's a nanosecond versus two nanoseconds, and <laughs> everything else is much slower. So uh, I don't think, I don't think if you want to improve the speed of a program, I wouldn't, that's not the first place I would look. But, yeah, I mean, if in doubt, test it. And uh, it's online, uh, uh, it's from the 2016 and I week, I gave a talk with Ed Dickens about benchmarking and optimization that tells you all uh, what, to, what to look out for, how to correctly benchmark code, because that's an art in itself, and a lot of misconceptions are there. And you get the wrong result, and uh, it doesn't really reflect the speed difference. For example, uh, you place this into a while loop, you get the loop rate. It's the nicest small atomic thing. Going back to the kitchen. The duck and there's a dish consisting of a deep bone chicken stuffed in a deep bone duck for the stuffed in a deep bone turkey. And one of the main problems we see is the stuffed event structure, right? <laughs> 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 you have a wire loop inside of a case structure, inside of an event structure, and everything locks up, right? So, yeah, you don't want to do that. You have a loop outside that can be used for spinning, and then you can do a, a split machine. So, we never want anything interactive inside an event structure. Uh, one thing, so events should not contain interactive code. One thing I found, and that, that, that took a long time for a night to fix, but they have now an option. You have rapid fire events, I call them. For example, if you have a, a cursor move event or a slide move, they generate them a million events, and if the event can't handle them, they sort of queue up and they rattle along for a long time. So now you can limit the maximum instances of the event to one, and so all the intermediate events get disregarded and everything remains interactive. So that's a good thing to know. And yeah? Would you mind the where that is found? That's in the event configuration. Value change events. See, you add stop, value change, and there is underneath there. Yeah. Okay. It can be very hard to decide what's better limit or what, or even touch, touch the touch event. Right. And all three do more or less the same, it's all the same problem. Yeah. It's, 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 yeah, it's easiest if you just limit to one. I, I do, I sometimes do different things even to discard even more. But, but I, I don't want to go into that. Okay, so, so my last topic is something that's really dear to my heart, and that's. Uh, uh, dictionary, and we uh, all most of you have heard about the the variant attributes. So I want to go into a couple of use cases because I think this is really something that everybody should use for many many things. So if you have key value pairs, right? Some of them we know very well. For example, forward index array. You give it the index, it gives you the value back. And this is very, very fast because from first principle on the data size, LabVIEW can instantly calculate where that is in memory. Of course, the reverse is harder if you have to search. For example, if you ask if a certain element is contained in an array and where is it, that takes much longer. And it's the same in the phone book. If I, if I ask you if a certain name is in the phone book, you can tell me relatively quickly. If I ask you a certain phone number is in the phone book, you have to flip for a long time through the entire thing because it's not sorted. So if an array is sorted, 
you can do a binary search here. You get a thousand elements here and need to look at, lo at, at most at like 10 elements to tell if it's in there or not. Whereas otherwise you need to search through the entire thing. So variant attributes are sort of a, a generic dictionary and you can also cache results in the same way. Go into that. So variant attributes. It's somewhat poorly named. I mean, back in the old days, we even had attribute nodes. They're not called property nodes. But it has nothing to do with waveform attributes or dynamic data attributes. So this is a real confusing. And it's tacked on the variants. It could be tacked on to anything else. but and I decided to tack it on the variance. Right, you can have a numeric and numeric attributes, you can do the same thing, but this is a good choice, it's not bad. So the value of the variant is, uh, itself is irrelevant, it can even be empty, you can have as many attributes you want in the variant, even if the variant is empty. So the key is always a string, it can be a binary string. If you search for a certain number, double number, you can just uh, typecast it to a string and use that as a key, and it will find it again. And the data can be anything we want. We just need to define it. I often use it uh, just as I32. And then so I look up if a value exists. And if it exists, it gives me a number that indexes into a large 2D array and some other arrays where I then have to really store it in place in a fixed size array. So internally, if you, uh, you can look that up on Wikipedia. It's, it uses a, an advanced tree structure to store data. Uh, and it's called a red-black tree. And it has a log n performance. That means it's as fast as sorted. And if you insert a new element or delete an element, the tree rebalances itself very quickly. And you always have that very fast lookup, insertion, deletion performance. That makes it very nice. A very simple one uh, came up on the forum very recently. Of course, the, you don't need to use it for that. But for example, you have a data of key value pairs, right? You just start out with an empty variant. It has to be in a shift transition. That's not like a reference, right? The variant itself contains the, the, contains the attributes. You take the keys and values. The, the name is the key, and the value is the second string. And just pump them into the, into the as attributes for each element. And now that variant contains all the, the entire table as attributes. And now the lookup is really, really easy. You just type the letter, and it will immediately return the corresponding value of that attribute. And the nice thing is, if there's a default value, you can type anything you want there, not found, for example. And it will return not found if it's not found. If you do the same thing with, for example, a 2D array, we have to search in this slice and then look it up and search array. And then if it's not found, we have to switch over to the not found string. So it's much more code. So this is much easier. So uh, there's another thing, another example from the forum. Somebody said, OK, I want to generate lottery numbers. And there are many ways to do that. So let's ignore that place. Let's ignore lottery, man uh, let's generate lottery numbers as fast as we can and stop once we reach, once we generate a lottery number that we have generated before. Right? So 
of course you could use a, an array of string and then whenever uh, we generate a new one, we can typecast into a string and add it to that array and search that array if it exists and stop if it, if it, if it exists. Or we can just cast it into an attribute as main and the value doesn't even matter, you can just do a zero. And there is a nice Boolean output replaced, that means as soon as we have a, a enter a name that already exists, we get a true there and we stop the loop. And this is amazingly fast. It's, yeah, maybe, yeah, well, well less than a second, it finds a duplicate. Because it, it, whenever it generates, it has to compare to many, many more, right? So the chance of finding a duplicate, you can type it. It can take a very long time, of course. But, uh, so I have an example where we compare the two speeds. So, so we generate four numbers. I make it a little faster. And you see, if it's this is not with the string, it takes per iteration. Let's, uh, we can look at it later. Uh, so it takes like a hundred milliseconds for four numbers. If we go to the variant version, it's uh, it's much faster. It's five microseconds per iteration. And most of it is probably the random number generation. So if you go now to five, now this thing really slows down. Three seconds. Of course, sometimes it's lucky. It finds it right away, right? And it, yeah, now it's really fast, 39 milliseconds. But it's all over the map. It can take a long time, 40 milliseconds, 136 average microseconds. Whereas if you go to the variant, go to the variant, it's still five microseconds. It just has to wait longer, so the elapsed time is longer, but it's still, per loop, it's still the same same amount of time. And if we go to, to five numbers, to six numbers, you know, if now it gets about a second, and the inter average loop time is still five microseconds. And the same for seven, now it probably takes more than, in, no, now more than a second, yeah. And I don't want to go to the string version with these numbers. That, uh, I mean, it takes like minutes to hours. <laughs> and so, as you can see, n log n, it goes, it goes very slowly up, and whereas the other one really explodes, it goes with the square, with the square of, of the, the number of values. Oh, no, I don't want to do that. So this is also, it makes the code simpler, right? And, and faster. And here is, you have like a, 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 a huge array of strings and you want to find duplicates. You just set the attribute, and if the attribute exists, it doesn't exist, it adds, it adds it at zero. If it already exists, it increments it one by one and writes it back. And at the end, if you read if you get the attributes and you don't wire the inputs, you get all of them as an array, and you can display them. And they're sorted automatically. And this one was also from the forum like last week. It's very interesting is you can do the variant, the variant attribute, the value can be a variant that itself has attributes. So if you look here, you look for all unique entries in the first column, and for each unique entry in the first column, you try to find all unique entries in the second column. And so we, we, we do the first one, 
and get an empty attribute the first time, then we add, uh, we'll add one attribute for the second column. And if the duplicate is over overwrite, so you automatically only get the un unique ones, at the end you read them out, and you get AAA has more than two, even though they're multiple, some of them are duplicates. BBE has one and three, and so on, and EES 10, 5, 8, and it's sorted alphabetically, not numerically. People can change that if they want. I mean, typically they're not numbers, they're other strings. So you can sort of put the turducken there, right? The variant inside a variant inside a variant inside a variant, and they all have their own attributes, and they're automatically sorted. So each key value has its own inner variant with its own attributes. And this is something I showed long ago in 2012. Uh, I use a variant attributes as a fixed size cache where I have 4,000, the last 4,000 spectra are stored because they need to be reused and reassembled. Uh, it, and that allows me to calculate each, all the spectra needed in parallel in any order and once that's done, I can assemble them, and that really helps parallelize. This is the performance without parallelization, and if I go parallelization, you see the more cores you have, the faster it gets. And I just, a couple of months ago, I bought myself a home computer as a new AMD Ryzen. AMD were always really bad, but now they're really good. Look at that, it's twice the Intel i7 at the same clock frequency. So technology advances. It's an eight core, of course, but it's, you know, even per core, it's faster than the Intel. And so, so remember, variant attributes are really, really, really nice. And they should, they should be used much more often. Yeah, 100% CPU use, yeah. even on, on the uh, 32 core system. There's a replacement thing for changing the seventeen. Oh, well, in the in place element structure, yeah. So yeah. getting and then setting it can be Yeah, so you can, can even streamline that. Yeah, it's it's I mean it's really I mean there you probably can write your own in lab, you write black tree, but the implementation lab is really, really good. Okay. So of course the world, the world is full of recreational distractions. Some can probably even help us hold our skill in problem work and looking at problems, right? Looking at, in, at relative uh, orientations. Uh, so instead of solving that daily crossword puzzle, we could just go to the forum during morning coffee and try to solve one of the problems that people pose. And that sort of will widen your horizon as a programmer uh, so you're not stuck in your rut on your own little domain, you know. There's a, like a daily class in Surfer Stevens where he has a very nice amount of puzzles. Uh, so let me finish up. I still have that poster in my, for, I mean, my office. It's from way in the late 90s. It's not ni.com, it's not inst.com. Somebody will remember that, then of course it's breaking a law, right? It's uh, it's graphy, it's it's dirty, and it's fun, and somehow we need to bring that back. I think. So back to the future, and have fun programming in LabVIEW. <laughs>